Good morning, and welcome to our panel discussion on race, equity, and opportunity in America. The trends, the challenges, and the solutions. I am Nanette Sykes. I'm Director of Race, Equity, and Inclusion for the Annie E. Casey Foundation, and I'm thrilled that all of you are here to join us this morning. Before we get started, I just want to take a moment to thank and acknowledge Center Stage for allowing us to use their space for today's panel discussion. As you can see, they are currently in the production of Marley, so we are truly grateful that they allowed us to enter their space. They are our neighbor, they're our longtime partner, um, and they allowed us to use their space while Marley is currently in session. So um, I haven't seen it yet, I understand it's fabulous, and I'm trying to get out here in the next couple of days to check it out, and hope for, uh, hopefully you will too if you haven't done so already. So all of you know Patrick, our, our president, and um, unfortunately, he sends his regrets. He's unable to be with us this morning. But Patrick has set a very ambitious set of results for our foundation. And we came to the realization that we will never be able to achieve those results without an explicit focus on race and equity in all of our work. So that's what we've been trying to do over the last several months. And earlier this year, we launched an internal talking about race series to really help our own staff to become more comfortable talking about race and to have a greater, greater understanding and a greater appreciation for the deep racial inequities that are plaguing far too many of our children, families, and communities. And so today, we invited you to join us in that conversation, to join us on our journey and to be partners with us as we think about how we can reduce the racial disparities and increase equitable opportunities that are plaguing uh, all of the populations that we serve. And so when I was thinking about this panel and I was thinking about my, my remarks, um, I went back and I reread a book that Dr. King wrote back in 1967. And the book is called, Where Do We Go From Here? From Chaos or Community. And in that book, Dr. King talked about our nation um, and that a nation um, as powerful as the United States, that every person should have a decent house, adequate education, and enough money to provide the basic necessities for one's families. In that book, Dr. King talked about poverty as being the source of world instability. So the Annie E. Casey Foundation, and I'm sure many of you and all of the organizations that you all work for, I'm sure that, you know, we truly believe that that value proposition for America still stands true today. But yet here we are in 2015, nearly 50 years later, and we are still a nation where too many people do not have access to the basic necessities they need to prosper. We have a national poverty rate hovering right around 11%. And that means millions of people, many of whom are people of color, they're being deprived of quality jobs, sufficient education, and real access to opportunities. And then bringing things closer to home, right here in our own backyard, neighborhoods in Baltimore are also suffering from generational poverty and a lack of sufficient resources. Just two miles away in Sandtown, Winchester, the community where the late Freddie Gray lived, a third of those families, a third of them, are living in extreme poverty. So I know statistics like these, they can be disheartening and they can feel troublesome, but we, like Dr. King, we have to believe and we have to have faith that the story does not have to end here. This is an opportunity moment for us. This is an opportunity moment for the city of Baltimore, and it's an opportunity moment for our country. Dr. King, he urged us to be courageous and creative dissenters who would call our nation to a higher destiny, to a new plateau of compassion, and to more noble expressions of humanness. So that's the purpose of today's panel discussion. And it's not only to acknowledge our current challenges and trends, because we can all do that, and the media seems to do that very well and seems to do that ad nauseum. But the real purpose is to really acknowledge the root causes of inequities and to explore solutions and strategies that allow each and every one of us to take action to disrupt the systemic racial inequities that exist in communities across our country. 
So with that said, I am excited about today's panel discussion, and I'm very um, pleased to be able to introduce our esteemed moderator for this morning's panel. We have the pleasure today of being joined by PolicyLink founder and CEO, Angela Glover Blackwell. Angela is a lifelong advocate for social justice and has worked tirelessly over the past 30 years to promote policies that lift our most vulnerable populations out of poverty. And as Angela moderates this morning's panel discussion, Angela will help us in creating our own narrative around the challenges our communities and our nation is facing and the things that we can do to disrupt the trends that we are seeing. So please join me in turning this over to Angela as she makes a few remarks to get us started. Thank you. Well, good morning. I am humbled to be here to moderate a conversation about race. I remember when I was in college uh, learning new things and then seeing the new thing that I learned everywhere. I know you've had that experience, that you learn what the name is of something or you learn a new concept and suddenly it's everywhere. You know it was always there, but you didn't have a name for it and therefore it hadn't been called out for you, it hadn't been brought into relief. Race has been brought into relief in this country and we have to do more than talk about it. We have to solve the problem that predates the founding of the nation. The racism, the exclusion, the disadvantage at which we have placed too many people because of their race, their ethnicity. This is an important moment I've been around for a long time now, been working for more than 35 years working on these issues. And for me, it is the most exciting moment that I have seen in terms of being able to understand deeply how we've gotten where we are and to commit ourselves to moving forward. The racism that we're calling out has been there all along but the media is now seeing it, it's bringing it out. People are talking about it in their homes, in their workplaces. We have to figure out how to be comfortable in that conversation. It is uncomfortable, and until we are comfortable, we won't stay in it, we won't search, we won't push ourselves. We've gotta get comfortable. We have to get comfortable beyond looking at what's in our hearts or in the hearts of others, and we have to understand what's been baked into the system and how it got baked there. We have to understand, even as we try to change, there are things about the way we systemically do things in this nation that cause the legacy and the impact of racism to continue. We have to be able to disaggregate the systems and understand how they're doing that, and then, Always, we have to talk about solutions. We can't just be satisfied with an elegant description of what is. We have to have an actionable agenda for achieving what needs to be. This is just the beginning, just the beginning. Uh, we're not gonna solve all of that in the next two hours, but we sure are gonna try to tee up every element of it that we're gonna have to keep talking about as we go forward. And we have a wonderful panel to help us do that. We have Peter Edelman, who is the Carmack Waterhouse Professor of Law and Public Policy at the Georgetown University Law School. <laughs> Joseph T. Jones, Jr., Joe Jones, who is the founder of the Center for Urban Families right here in Baltimore. and Rafael Lopez, who is the Senior Policy Advisor at the White House Office of Science and Technology. I see he has a fan club. He's held positions at the Anna E. Casey Foundation. And while we're celebrating him, he is also President Obama's nominee for Commissioner of Children, Youth, and Families at the U.S. Department. Let's get started. Peter, let's start with you. Um, I want to start off by talking about poverty and systemic challenges that we have always faced. How did we get where we are? There were so many people of color concentrated in poverty and many in deep poverty. 
everybody knows, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm here you, you, uh, to be the first speaker in what I'm going to say. I think really uh, you all know, and Joe and Raphael uh, live it. But uh, let me say first, I'm just delighted to be part of this, uh, just absolutely delighted. Um, when Nanette talked about the, the uh, fact that you're all working on connecting race to everything you do in the foundation, uh, that's essentially what I came here to urge, or I know that you're doing it. Um, but we, we really, it, it's uh, fascinating might be one word, that uh, we all know that you can't talk about poverty without talking about race uh, in our country. Uh, and uh, yet, in our work, in, whether it's uh, in a political context or a philanthropic uh, context, uh, we've tended not to do that. Um, maybe thinking actually correctly that so much uh, of poverty as an issue cuts across um, all lines of race and ethnicity. Uh, we're a low-wage uh, country now. Uh, that affects everybody. At the same time, it disproportionately affects people of color. It disproportionately affects women of color. Uh, and yet, uh, we haven't focused, haven't, haven't uh, divided our focus, if you will. And so the challenge, uh, Angela, I think, uh, is to be on, on two tracks at once here. Uh, that is to say, uh, we, need, we always remember and we need to say out loud uh, in our work and, and uh, in, our, in our politics, uh, in our governance, that the largest single group of people who are poor are white. That's very important that, for people to, to uh, act on that basis. And that so many things that uh, disproportionately affect people of color are nonetheless uh, also uh, shared as problems uh, with uh, people of, of every background, of all races and ethnicities. Uh, so um, we, we need to be doing two things at once. Uh, politically, I would say uh, that on the one hand, there should be a, a politics of being one America, and at the same time, we need a politics of identity uh, that holds up the particularities of groups, particularly African Americans, Latinos, uh, in, in uh, the, the special ways uh, in, in which the, the politics uh, have a racial aspect to them. So that, that's, that's the first point I want to make. On, on the history that you asked me, uh, Angela, um, of course, we're so interested, Casey and in so much of its work, uh, you certainly, and I think all of us, Connect, uh, insist that so much of the work, that much of the work uh, having to do uh, with the questions of race are questions of place. And so that's one of the histories. Uh, obviously, uh, there is a, a deep, deep, horrible history in our country that's even more fundamental than that, that goes back to slavery in our country, and we're not, not finished with, with, with all of that. But uh, without going through all the details, because there isn't time, uh, and certainly not for an opening remark, uh, the question of place, uh, well, concentration of poverty is not something that's completely uh, racial. Look at, at uh, towns in the Rust Belt that were uh, vibrant 40 years ago uh, and are almost all white and are now falling apart. That's concentrated poverty as well, Appalachia as well. But the particular history uh, for African Americans is uh, the, the original segregation that was uh, a combination of state and federally mandated uh, and uh, reinforced by uh, the, the behavior of banks and realtors and uh, just plain people selling their houses uh, in a way that was legal at the time, discriminatory. Uh, and so that's how we ended up in particular uh, with these neighborhoods these, uh, that have uh, the, the uh, exponential problems, the interacting problems that we see in, uh, in, here in Baltimore, uh, in Santon, Winchester, and across the country in large cities. So that's, that's the historical point. Um, last point, and we'll have, I, I know, uh, 
I'll get another chance. Uh, Several. <laughs> thank you. Uh, we started, in particular, working on these questions of urban concentrated poverty. I did have a finger in it, uh, because Bedford-Stuyvesant in Brooklyn was one of the early uh, places, uh, along with Ted Watkins in Los Angeles, uh, and uh, Arthur Brazier in Chicago. Okay. <laughs> One for Ted Watkins, zero for Arthur Brazier. <laughs> Got to work on that. Uh, and, and so we've, we've learned a lot, uh, up to and including promised neighborhoods. Uh, but uh, we, we now know, uh, and uh, uh, with, with the work of Raj Chetty and his uh, colleagues uh, uh, at Harvard, that uh, the idea of moving to opportunity has a greater validity than the data up to now we had thought. So when we talk strategically, uh, we have, uh, uh, I would say, a more complex opportunity in terms of lifting up neighborhoods and creating the choice for people to move. So we've learned a lot. Uh, Angela, you've taught us more than anybody else that we have to consider what happens in inner cities uh, uh, in a regional context. Uh, so uh, with all of the sadness and tragedy and awfulness of, of what's happened uh, around the country and here, in Baltimore, the, the fact is that uh, when we take this opportunity now, and it is a must uh, to be leaders uh, in the, uh, the opportunity that's been provided to us by these tragedies, uh, to put race much more into the dialogue without forgetting the, the totality of poverty, uh, we, uh, we do know that we know uh, actually better some of the things that we should be trying to do about it. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I actually taught a class at NYU this past semester on race class in American cities. And one of the things that the students did was they uh, found those redlining maps and looked at the, uh, the geography of those and then compared them with concentrations of black poverty today. And the students were astounded. I wasn't surprised, but the students, <laughs> but the students were astounded when they saw it. Um, it. It is amazing how that legacy continues. Before I go on to Joe to talk about how this is really playing out in communities, say a, a couple of more words about how explicit the exclusion was, because we had, we, as we look at our economy now, and we recognize what we're missing in terms of not having strong unions, in terms of not having the kind of safety nets, not having the kind of guarantees that came with the GI Bill and other things, just say a word about how that played out racially, because a lot of people really don't know how baked in the exclusion was. I certainly find that with my students just as, as uh, its own small example. Uh, and, and of course, uh, we lived in a world until 1954 in Brown and in terms of the, of the uh, enormously important uh, historic uh, civil rights legislation of, uh, of 64, 65, and especially in this context, fair housing in 1968. Uh, so we lived in a world, don't have to tell you, we lived in a world of state-mandated man uh, segregation uh, and with a uh, quote-unquote freedom of people, because there were no legal barriers to it, a freedom of people to uh, openly discriminate. I mean, th that's, that's the basic fact. And, and uh, the form that it took uh, in terms of the inner city is people uh, came up from the south, uh, uh, and uh, had only had the choice of living in certain parts of, of the community, could not move out even. Uh, the only way they could move out is if they had the money themselves, and even there it was very difficult because they had to find somebody who would sell something to them, but they couldn't get financing, and that, and that lack of financing was indeed uh, totally uh, approved and even mandated by federal law, not just uh, state and local uh, law. So, um, of course, we still have, in so many ways, the old discrimination. Uh, we still have people violating uh, Title uh, VII uh, on, on uh, employment and, and uh, violating uh, in ways that are, that are 
overt uh, on housing and, and so on. But now uh, it's also been uh, in, in some ways that are very uh, systemically uh, thought through uh, and others uh, that, that maintain kind of customs, we now have the combination of structural racism and implicit bias. Uh, so to a degree, it's a good thing. Uh, it's a considerable degree. It's important that we've gotten rid of those legal barriers. Um, but the new racism is really more insidious, more dangerous, uh, harder uh, to, to uh, weed it out. Thank you. That walks us right up to you, Joe. How are, how's all this playing out in Baltimore today? What, what legacy are we still dealing with? What's still going on that places people at extreme disadvantage as they try to do best by their families and themselves? Yeah, so by show of hands, how many people in the audience are not from Baltimore? So quite, almost all of the folks here are not from Baltimore. So here's the lens through which I come to this conversation. Uh, I'm a Baltimorean. Uh, my mom lives a couple of blocks away from where I work. Uh, and where I work is uh, in, in, on Monroe Street in West Baltimore, which is directly across the street from the church where Freddie Gray's funeral was held, two blocks down from Mondam and Mall, where the unrest began to kick off, and four blocks away from the intersection of North and Pennsylvania, where the CBS that burned was uh, looped uh, throughout the video. The first thing that, you know, that struck me uh, with respect to current situations was the, uh, the day of the funeral. And I walked across the street to go to the funeral, and I didn't know Freddie Gray. Uh, and my, my building is in zip code 21217, uh, which is also encompasses Sandtown, Winchester. And I'll come back to that zip code. Uh, when I went uh, into the church and I went to look at Freddie's body, this reaction came over me. Uh, outside was the world media. Every media outlet that you can think of from around the globe had descended on Baltimore and that church. And I looked at Freddie, and it, it hit me that none of us ever knew the name Freddie Gray. But now when you say Freddie Gray, this 25-year-old black man uh, has lifted up a cloak of <laughs> issues that we all now, when we say Freddie Gray, we know exactly what we're talking about, we know where we're talking about it, and it's the impetus for us having a conversation like this today. So the first thing that comes to mind is the sacrifice that uh, happened with a young man, mm -hmm. all right? Uh, so 21217 is Sandtown, Winchester, where my building is. To the right and going up in a community called Park Heights, and landmark would be Pimlico Racecourse. Right? That's zip code 21215, uh, right? If you go a couple of blocks down to North Avenue and to the west is zip code 21216. That's where my mom lives. Landmark would be Coppin State University. Within those three zip codes, there are approximately 2,400 men who owe more than $20 million in back state old child support. Right? That's not my data. That's child support data. Right? It also happens to be three zip codes, the three top zip codes that people returning from incarceration come back to. Right? There's absolutely no way that a community can absorb that level of depravity and you can expect it to go away. The other thing that strikes me is that uh, this ain't new. <laughs> right? This has been existing for a hell of a long time. Right? Uh, the other thing that strikes me uh, that's different from Ferguson right? There has to be political upheaval and change in Ferguson, right? In terms of the inclusion of people of color in the political process. In Baltimore, every leadership position is occupied by a person of color, right? So if we can't get it right in Baltimore, right, how can we realistically expect that we can, as Peter talked about, this insidious issue uh, and that's one of the reasons why I'm so pleased that Casey uh, has taken the opportunity to create a space to have this conversation 
and have brought three of my champions, Angela, Peter, and Raphael, uh, to, uh, to the stage to have this conversation. Because the conversation around race is not easy, but it absolutely has to happen. But it can't be so consuming that it, it makes you sick, right? Because the history of African Americans in this country is one that, with a true story, has always been camouflaged, right? And people have asked us not to, you know, dwell on our story consistently, right? Well, how in the hell can you not dwell on it if it's a part of who you are, your legacy? And I don't know any other population where consistently a young person who graduates from college, right, more often than not will say, I'm first generation college graduate, right? That just is not something that can continue. And so when I think about you know, the current situation, uh, it's bad. But I think we've got a lot of opportunity in here. One, of course, is because we have uh, people of color that occupy uh, leadership positions within the, uh, within the city. And they should be held accountable. And they should be obligated to work day and night to change this. And I know and believe that uh, they are. Uh, but we also have to recognize that a lot of the uh, boys and men of color who we're talking about are so acutely marginalized. They're not just marginalized. They are acutely marginalized. And uh, when I heard uh, Angela and uh, Peter talking about their students, the same young men who I work with in Baltimore, they know the same information. They are just as articulate and knowledgeable, even though they haven't been on a college campus. So they're not dumb. And so this whole social change and social movement through Black Lives, Black Lives Matter and other movements, right, it's, it's being built by young people from our community, some on college campuses, some that are not. But they are not going to stand around and let the image of what happened in, in North Charleston, where you had a, a, a man, not even, you couldn't even call it a goddamn run. Right? He was loping along, and a person, another American, shot him in the back. And our little children have to see that. And then we have to, as adults and as parents, right, because that's continuously looped, we have to figure out how we have to have conversations with those little children who are expected to go to school and learn, who are expected not to be subjected to stop and frisk, right, uh, broken window, Right? And the other kind of zero tolerance policies that sucks up large numbers of black men in this country that really disconnects them from so many systems, particularly the labor market. And so when I think about those things, that's the context in which we're dealing with, not just in Baltimore, but around the country. And the epicenter of what happened in Baltimore is now beginning to fester itself around the country. So as Americans, black, white, Latino, Asian, whatever color you can think of, all of us have an obligation to work together in concert to be able to figure out how do we make fair and just society for each and every one of us. Thank you, Joe. I want to stick with you a little bit, though, and we're going to get to solutions. But before we get to solutions, I would like for you to say more about the things that are happening in the zip codes that you just described, particularly with boys and young men of color, that represent systems failure. So as you think about systems failure in those zip codes, what things come to mind? Well, one, uh, I alluded to this whole notion of uh, child support. So, for example, uh, you got Keisha and you got Raheem, right? Keisha and Raheem are poor. They come from families of, poor the, of, of origin of the poor, but they meet one another and they feel like they're compatible with one another and they come together and eventually they have a child. Right? Uh, from, a, uh, pu from a social welfare and public policy standpoint, we want to make sure that Keisha has a healthy birth. But because they're poor, the most likely place that we can ensure she gets quality prenatal care is to go to the welfare office. She goes to the welfare office and she says, well, I'm in a relationship with my child's, uh, with my expectant father, uh, and uh, we need benefits. The system will say to her, well, you're income eligible. However, we need Raheem's information so that we can establish paternity and debt. At a point where we should say, because she indicated that they are together, they should be bringing Keisha and Raheem to the table together to say, hey, Keisha, we're not just going to help you go from welfare to work and give Raheem debt that you got to go home and tell him about. We want to ask and figure out how we're going to be Raheem, bring Raheem to the table so that we can create a case plan that will help both of you and your trajectory outside of welfare and offer public benefits ultimately. Right? That is a system, a policy shift that needs to happen. So that's, that's one example. 
Another key example is that of uh, young men, uh, when you have a zero tolerance policy, right, and you suck up young men uh, with arrests that don't necessarily need to lead to conviction. However, when they leave the court, they have an arrest record. Now, I work with a lot of employers. Employers are very smart at making the bottom line, meeting the bottom line. However, they have a very hard time when they look at a criminal record discerning between an arrest and a conviction, right? So what they will do, hey, it's great meeting you. We'll give you a call. They never get that darn call, right? And so we've got to realize that if someone in, is engaged in our criminal justice system and they don't have a conviction, they should automatically, when they walk out of there, have that expunged from their record, right? Now, I am an ex-offender and a recovering addict, right? There were times when I needed to be incarcerated because I did some dumb stuff and should be held accountable, right? But when you don't, Right? Let's not continue to marginalize and acutely marginalize boys and men of color. And we should not, under any circumstances, when a young boy acts real silly in class, expel or ex ex suspend him because we can't deal with the behavior of young boys. Thank you. So, Raphael, you've worked within a lot of these systems at the local, state, and the federal level. What is going on that the very systems that if you read their mission, you would think they would be solving these problems are actually contributing to the, the challenges that we're describing? Oh, well, first off, I just want to start by saying that um, though I was born and raised in California and consider that home, Baltimore too is my home and I have so many people here in this community that are my family and my we friends. We could tell when you walked out, it was like, I love. Beyonce <laughs> out. Yeah. Well, you know, it, Baltimore, when, you know, I, it's interesting because when you're not from here, right, which I was reminded of regularly, <laughs> you know, uh, for example, first week here in Baltimore, I had moved from California, and the first day I got, where did you go to school? And I was like, well, that's weird, I don't get asked that. But then they said, where did you go to high school? Yeah. And for those who are from Baltimore, the, quest, the coded question where you went to high school is did you go to public school? Did you go to the traditionally black elite high schools, right? Did you go to, you know, and, and you start to parcel out the zip codes. And even though I was raised in a part of California that remains and ch challenged by extraordinary racism, um, how it manifests itself in Baltimore was just so much more in your face. Uh, now that all said, uh, it strikes me <clears throat> that um, these systems, uh, though they are codified into law, right, in, in pre-civil rights era and the, and the, in the laws that Peter mentioned um, that were sort of struck down by the courts in the 60s, um, these systems operate by people. So systems don't raise children. You know, families do. Systems don't educate children, Baltimore, Watsonville, wherever. Teachers do. Families do. And I'm struck by the fact that uh, we are still struggling with um, the sort of post-codification of those laws. So for example, in terms of a systems framework, um, there is um, something that has happened recently that has come in sort of the, to the public consciousness around uh, uh, suspensions. So while the national conversation has mostly been around junior high and high school suspensions in the system and disaggregating that data, people are surprised to learn that there is a growing number of preschool children suspended in our system. Now, interestingly, the data uh, points to the fact that it is generally our native children, African-American children, and Latino children. And the question becomes, what does a child do at four or three years of age that the solution is, let us kick them out of school? and then have no systems to support the family, much in the way that Joe was mentioning, uh, to make sure that these children are on track. So systems respond when people take courageous action, uh, and they themselves in their formal and informal roles, right? Not just the people who have a title, but the people who run the system, the people who run contracts or grants, if you work at the Casey Foundation, or answer the phones, or do the accounting. All of the people who have informal power, and quite a bit of it, I might add, um, someone within the system has to raise their voice and say, this is not okay. Now, interestingly, around the preschool suspension, there is some significant work being done across the country. One coming from communities like Baltimore, uh, throughout Oakland, San Francisco, um, throughout the Midwest, on, in tribal communities, because people 
individuals raised up and said, we will not tolerate this kind of behavior. Uh, it is not okay to suspend at a disproportionate rate young children under five years old, who are then, much like their junior high and high school brothers and sisters, then tagged as problem children, right? So now the struggle becomes where in law or where in systems are we codifying this kind of behavior, right? Well, interestingly, there is new movement from, for example, the Health and Human Services Department around making sure that uh, there's a reduction in preschool suspensions. And it has taken fire. There have been significant um, uh, conversations across the country because people were, one, surprised, but two, willing to sort of take uh, action on this particular issue. And um, so point one. Point two, on the issue of sort of systems uh, writ large, having worked at multiple layers, right, in local government, in city and county government, in state government, um, and with nonprofits and philanthropy, I'm struck by the fact that ultimately, um, you know, we may name um, the systems for what they are, but the one that comes to mind the most and has the most significant amount of peer-reviewed studies is the healthcare system. And there was a point at which, during um, uh, uh, Martin Luther King's uh, final years, he was talking about the inequities in the healthcare system. And uh, there had been significant work done in migrant farm worker communities who often were at the brunt of, of, of lack of access to healthcare systems. And interestingly, though both Cesar Chavez and Martin Luther King shined a light on these inequities, what was stunning was that when the data was revealed to the medical community, be you a physician, a medical um, assistant, or a nurse, and despite the fact that all of these studies were peer-reviewed, people just couldn't believe uh, the lack of morality with the fact that these professionals were not doing their jobs. Within that, there is a system of implicit and explicit bias. So if you are a person um, who is poor, for example, and don't have regular access to health care, and you go to a doctor who's making assumptions about you and making judgments about you, and that visit um, tells you you are not welcome, you are not worthy, you are not responsible, it is highly unlikely that that person will come back to see that doctor, generally during hours that aren't convenient to that family. Now, I give that sort of national example of you know, peer-reviewed because that's the way in which structurally people understand systems, right? Peer-reviewed journals, lifting up the data. But I want to strip that back down to Baltimore before we continue the conversation, specifically on healthcare. So um, when I first moved here, one of the first projects I worked on at the Family League was a conversation that at the time Mayor Dixon and the head of the health department um, started to kick off around the infant mortality rate in Baltimore. So the zip codes that Joe was talking about, let me bring them to life in a slightly different way and talk about inequities in systems. Um, literally day two on the job, I believe, I was at a press conference with the mayor and the health department and I had to spend all night reading up on what I was gonna say about this work that I was gonna help lead. What struck me was that there are very specific neighborhoods in Baltimore that when you take a look at the disaggregated data, they contribute disproportionately to the number of infant deaths. Now, most people wouldn't know that Baltimore's infant mortality rate, infant mortality rate competed with third world countries. Also, people didn't know that, when, that the infant mortality rate in Baltimore is what drove up the infant mortality rate in Maryland. And what we did with a colleague, Jenna O'Keefe, who's here in the audience, and several others, was cause a little bit of trouble in this area because we actually took a look at the data that Joe's talking about in disaggregated neighborhoods, and we said, we're actually gonna put a stake in the ground on this issue, and we are going to align the system in a very different way, name the beast, and we're gonna focus on very specific neighborhoods that are contributing to this infant mortality, and we are not gonna do it absence of the family structure and network. It's not just a woman's problem, it is a family problem. It might be the grandmother, who. It, Everybody in that sort of uh, structure is responsible for helping make sure these babies lift up. The, in the first year alone of the Be More for Healthy Babies campaign, infant mortality was reduced in Baltimore by 18%. Year one. Within three years, and Jenna, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it was uh, 37%. Um, and I'm not sure where Jenna is because I can't see you, but there we go. I think I was right about the three years, right? right. The point of it is systems right, that are codified into law don't operate on their own. They operate because of people. Doctors, nurses, medical assistants, grandmothers, people, family, fathers, 
All of these individuals make up that system. And at the end of the day, whether you're talking about chronic absenteeism or you're talking about infant mortality or any of the redlining that Peter and Joe and, and Angela have already mentioned, it is at the end of the day about risk and courage. And you have to be able to, within these systems, at every level of our country, be able to stand up in your own role, whatever that role is, and be courageous and take the risk to name the beast and be willing to work on it. And finally, you have to love the people you are serving. I deeply, deeply believe that anybody doing this work in systems who thinks they're saving children be it black boys in Baltimore, be it Mexican boys in Watsonville, California, or be it you know, women who are victims of domestic violence, you can't save anybody, but you can serve them. You can say to them, I believe in you, and I believe that you have the potential to do extraordinary things in this world. And I think if we were more courageous, and we took more risks in systems, and we loved the people that we were serving more, we could take this opportunity that Angela mentioned in her opening remarks and really turn this moment of what is pain for our country and pain for places like Baltimore and turn it completely around. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I, I've heard Cornel West say that a number of times. You can't serve the people if you don't love the people. It is, it is really quite a, a profound observation. It really is. I want to go deeper on place, Peter. Uh, those of you who have heard me speak before have heard me say that where you live in America is a proxy for opportunity. It determines everything, including how long you live and how well you live while you live. But it determines whether you get to go to a good school, whether you have any value you can take out of your home, whether you live near a job or in a natural job network. It's, it's extraordinary. I have been so impressed with the work that Raj Chetty and his colleagues have been doing at Harvard and UC Berkeley, where they have taken big data and they have made that point that where you live is a proxy for opportunity. I mean, you know, it's one thing for me to say it, it's another to have the big data say it, isn't it? Um, and it has been interesting, though, because it makes another point. And that is that when you look at their maps and you see the places where you have the least economic mobility in this country, it turns out to be the same places where you have had a lot of underinvestment in people of color, where you have concentrations of poor black people and you have too little investment in the public school system, too little investment in a public transportation system. Not only does it hold back the people of color, but it holds back everybody so that you see less economic mobility for white people who live there too. I wonder if you would talk about that work, Peter, but also talk about it in something that you uh, referenced before in terms of moving the opportunity. If where you live is a proxy for opportunity, what ought we be doing about that? Uh, and of course, if I weren't here, <laughs> you could answer that question better than I would. <laughs> so, but you are here. <laughs> well, you know, one of the things that we've learned uh, over, over the years, but we don't do it uh, in any consistent way, uh, is uh, that these questions uh, of what zone, uh, what, what zip code you live in, uh, are so uh, determinative of what happens in your life. Uh, and it is so complicated because uh, when somebody asks you, uh, what's your zip code, that's home. That, that's their community. And uh, if you say, if you come and you, even if you quote unquote do this right, uh, at least as to moving to opportunity, a lot of people will say, I'm not going. Um, so uh, the, it, it makes the, it makes the, the work uh, so much harder. Uh, certainly one of the lessons here you've heard in this conversation, um, because uh, Joe, you, you, you talk about uh, the person who's just got an arrest record, uh, and it just takes them down, uh, maybe for their whole life. Well, this is outside the zip. Uh, the, uh, we haven't seen the connection between uh, the, the issues that exist uh, in a low-income neighborhood with all of these outside uh, forces that are determining by kind of remote control, all 
were carried out by people uh, who, who were there. So if you look at, uh, at Sandtown Winchester, for example, and a lot of you know a lot about it, um, that when you go back to the Rouse, uh, James Rouse, and all of the, the work that he uh, led, and Casey was involved in, in, in others, um, they didn't do so much with these outside forces. Uh, the police, they never got to, to the police, really, to, to change uh, the behavior, which would be partly within the neighborhood and partly would be the, the, the functioning of the whole criminal justice system. Uh, you, you know, if, if, if we're going to move in this opportunity that we have now, body cameras aren't going to get you there. That's not enough. We need to dig a lot deeper. So we need to be talking about the whole question of how we uh, hire police, uh, how we train police on a continuing basis. We need to be talking about the whole question of the sentencing sy system, in, including... Uh, uh, getting rid of expungement. Um, but you look at the prisons in this country, and the prison, the number of people in prison is uh, the same as it was five years, ten years, well over two million people. Well, why is that? Crime's going down all over the country. I mean, we have serious problem uh, um, here in, in many ways, but, but as a national matter, um, the uh, Crime has gone down, and yet it's the same number of people. Why is that? Well, look at the sentencing. Mandatory minimums, three strikes and you're out. We've got to tackle that. We've got people, organizations that are running jails and are delivering health care in the jails and prisons, and they're making money and doing horrible things to people while they're making that money. Now, that's all part of the answer to your question. Uh, the, the whole question of, of schools, uh, and you've gone through, uh, you had Superintendent Alonzo and various things that were good happened in, in the system as a result. But when I looked at it uh, 10, 15 years ago, uh, within the neighborhood of, of uh, Sandtown, they were able to get, uh, take over the elementary school, the community was, but they were never able to take over the middle schools and the high schools. And so uh, there was policy downtown that was, in effect, too far away to affect. So again, you cannot talk about a neighborhood as though everything that you want to do uh, that needs to be done and can be done is within the zip code. It just doesn't work that way. And so we, we uh, I hope, and you, of course this is your work, uh, regional putting it all in a regional framework, the whole transportation question of people getting to where the jobs are, as, as well as the idea of moving to opportunity. Even if you can't move to opportunity, uh, you certainly can be transported in, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it, it, this isn't a, a city of six million people. Um, you can get from here to, to where the jobs are. But then there's a whole question of what's the hiring policy. There's the whole question about whether the preparation was, was actually good enough uh, so that the person is actually qualified. Mm -hmm. It's all interconnected. Uh, and uh, it, it is frustrating, uh, but it's also a challenge, particularly now when we've lifted this up, that uh, we, can, we can be clearer um, about the fact that we have to attack all of these things and at the same time that we really want the, whole, the public school system for the whole city to function for every child there, it's heavily minority, but nonetheless, uh, it's the whole system, but be open and clear about the fact that there is the structural uh, racism and there is the implicit bias uh, going on. So um, I think that's the, the, the challenge of, of the work of place mm -hmm. today. Uh, and it, 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 there's an opportunity, moving to opportunity, but, but it's really twofold. The, the key word is choice, in my view. Mm -hmm. It is making it possible for the people who want to stay in the zip code to do there, live there as part of a healthy neighborhood, which, which includes more income for people who live there, which includes more jobs, et cetera, et cetera, so that we gradually build the community from within, but we also create the very re real opportunity to choose to live elsewhere. 
Thank you. Um, I'm going to come back to you, Joe, to lift us up a bit and tell us the kind of things that we can do. I want to underscore Peter's point before I do that, though. He said it's two things, but he actually described three. Um, certainly, people need to be able to move to communities that are rich with opportunity. And for low-income Black and Latino and Native American and Asian groups, this means the housing has to be affordable in communities where there is opportunity. We certainly need to make sure that every community is a community of opportunity, which was the thing that Peter described in terms of good schools and all of that. And we need to make sure that we're investing in people being able to link to opportunity wherever it might be through public transportation system and linkages with uh, jobs and training programs and all of that. So connecting to opportunity, living near opportunity, but the highest form of equity and regional equity is for every community to be a community of opportunity, which is the work that you've been doing, Joe. But I want to come back to you because we agree that this is an amazing moment. Um, we're not discovering anything. Uh, everything that we're talking about, there are people who've been living it and complaining about it and could not be heard. People who have been studying it and trying to provide service out of love have been seeing it and have been outraged about it, have to really calm themselves down because the more you know, the more angry you get. We're not discovering anything, but we have a moment where everybody's looking at it. How do we make something out of this moment? Well, in the words of Rapinelli, it's getting hot in here, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's this, whole, this whole notion of a place, right? In terms of how do we get beyond where we are, take advantage of uh, what I really believe is a, a, a solid foundation in Baltimore. You know, we really have done some great things here, but I think uh, as intellectually uh, capable as we are as a society, we have really fallen short uh, when it comes to what really needs to happen in community that I don't think we have tried, uh, researched, tested enough to be able to figure out how does this strategy that I'm about to talk about actually lead to the improvement in our communities beyond what we have significantly tried before. Uh, and so I grew up uh, professionally, uh, once I came out of my madness, in the uh, Baltimore City Health Department uh, through its infant mortality strategies. Uh, but what we haven't done as a society, particularly within social welfare, uh, when it comes to maternal and child health, that in and of itself, maternal and child health, for all the right reasons, right, it does not connect the men who help bring children into the world into the family equation, right? And so even when we say family services, it's usually code for women and children, right? Mm -hmm. So what we have done in Sandtown, Winchester, and other areas around the country, we have invested significantly in bricks and mortar. We've invested significantly in women and children, right? And when it comes to men, we still know very little about how to address the needs of men, Peter, Joe, or Raphael, or Raheem, right? And so what we do, we make assumptions because we read a goddamn textbook, and we think we know about family systems, but we know little about men. And so when I look back at the body of work that we were engaged in in Sandtown, Winchester, uh, beginning in 1989, I can think of limited investment in uplifting men, fathers. Uh, next, not next week, uh, June 16th, I'll be at the United Nations with the Clinton Foundation and uh, Men Care. How many people looked at the Super Bowl this year and noticed the change in the narrative relative to uplifting dads in a very positive way? Astonishing, right? So uh, at the United Nations, the Clinton Foundation and Men Care are going to launch this international effort to look at the role of fathers in our communities, right? So this is going to be what I believe is something that we have got to do consistently. We can't allow what takes place in Sandtown, Winchester, and other indigenous communities around the country to be only limited to what we do with women and children because we isolate the men and we put them on the sideline. And when we have unrest, right, those who are acutely marginalized, who are frustrated, who are left out of the labor economy, right, they do the kind of things behaviorally, right, that are inconsistent with our values. But it makes sense if you think about how we treat the kind of people that we're talking about, right? And uh, 
I will add that as we continue to build on the understanding of what it takes to in include men in family uh, initiatives, strategies, and systems, right? And particularly as we now are in this new space talking about true gen work, right, across foundations, philanthropy, we have got to think about, uh, you know, how intentionally we include men, right? And we can't simply just do it by randomized controlled trials, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I want to spend a second here just yeah, talking about this, right? <laughs> The stuff that goes on in the communities relative to men, you can do randomized controlled trials and you can get all the quantitative data you want, but we really won't learn the richness of what we need to do and what takes place unless we combine it with ethnographic research, right? And so we've got to continue to build on that and push it. And associated with that is something that really disturbs me, right? So we're having this, com this conversation. My brother's keeping, so I love President Obama, right? I got, a picture with my, I got a picture with my mom, right, in the middle of me and President Obama. My mom's 81 years old. Can you believe how she feels, right? <laughs> However, right, when we talk about my brother's keeper and other initiatives, we start talking about we're going to invest in boys and men of color up to age 24, 26. What the hell do we do with the ones who are 27, 28, 29 in our community? They ain't going nowhere. Right? So all of the investment that we can put into a community, we're still leaving out a significant segment of the population who are still disenfranchised, disaffected, and their behavior is going to still impact the kind of things we do in our community. And we have allowed ourselves to let that conversation right, uh, morph organically into something that we've kind of accepted. Yep, 26 years old. If you're 26 and a half years old, you get no services. That's ludicrous. So I'm telling you that if you're engaged in this work and you don't push back against that and you have a conversation with me about 26 as the cap, you will have a really hard conversation, right? That is unconscionable. We can't do that in communities that we expect Sandtown, Winchester, and any other community to thrive. So uh, you would like, you, I'm sure you know about it, what uh, Mitch Landrew is doing in New Orleans, where he is actually combining the work that they were doing to stop the killing that was going on to connect people to the economy. And what he calls out to justify that work is a, a depressing data point that 52% of all black men in New Orleans from uh, 16 to 64 or without work. And so that is the group that he's targeting. So I want you to tell us about how strategies are emerging to connect people to the economy, to connect people to work, men and women, because I could see us doing the first thing that you've talked about. I could see us including men, and I could see social services and family services actually looking at it, systemic racism and hiring people to do something different. But if people don't connect to jobs and good jobs, we're going to be right back here. I know this is part of your agenda. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is the key. Right? We, first of all, we have to continue to invest in making sure that kids are consistently in school and they matriculate and they come out with a credential that will allow them to be ready for the labor force. And uh, within that, I just don't believe that we should allow people to graduate who can't read and write. Right? And so when we start thinking about uh, grade level reading, I would make sure that when we get to middle school, that before you get into middle school, we understand where you are at that particular point. And if you're falling short, we have some additional emphasis that we place while you're in middle school. Before you get to high school, we assess again to make sure that consistently we improve the potential that when someone leaves high school, they're ready. Right? Because what happens on the back end, you may have a high school credential, but you don't qualify for advanced education or training because Either you go into remedial classes at college, right? I was 31 years old in college taking remedial classes. Good God Almighty, do you know how psychologically hard it was yeah, for me to I do that? that? I was ready to quit almost every day until I met this young lady who I've been married to for 25 years who, held, who hung in there with me, right? <laughs> <laughs> so place and women do matter, right? Uh, <laughs> but we also have, we find ourselves in a place where uh, we have not recovered relative to the conversation we're having from the, 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 the move from the industrial and manufacturing era, right, to service technology and STEM, right, where the men who we are a large part of our conversation, they have not been able to make that transition. Mm -hmm. 
So what has replaced the economy that was once a place where someone with limited education could purchase a house, help pay for their child's education, right, is largely uh, the gap that has filled that has been the, the, the drug culture in many of the communities we're talking about. And in Baltimore, we have this thing called the, uh, the highway to nowhere. So it's in West Baltimore where we thought we were gonna connect the inner city to the outskirts of the city, but we didn't build the highway. So we took all these neighborhoods, these, these houses, we dislocated people, and we didn't build jack, right? And so what we have now is large numbers of men who've been sucked up out of the community into the criminal justice system, back into the community who are not yet in a position where they can be engaged in the labor force. So as we prepare our young people to consistently be in school and, and then prepare them for the labor market, we gotta do something here now. The urgency of now is upon us relative to the large number of men in our community who don't get connected to the labor force and can't. And so the only way that I can think that from a macro standpoint, we can do this and we can do it now based on not a manufactured need, but a real need. So how many of us drive a car right, or go over a bridge, and two weeks from then, you put your car into the auto mechanic shop because your axle broke, your tire broke, because we had not invested in the upkeep of our infrastructure, right? We know that it is a legitimate need. So we could create a major jobs program just around, just around replacing our obsolete uh, transportation system, our sewer system, in a way that creates jobs across sectors, right? Because you still need engineers for those jobs, you still need laborers for those jobs, you still need specialized apprenticeship-like uh, 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 credentials to be able to do that. We can create that kind of pathway that we can create large numbers of jobs that fits and meets an American need. And most people that you talk to will agree to that. However, because of the polarization that we have in DC and other places, we can't seem to get on the same page. And I think that we have to create advocacy around that that does not allow America to be off the hook if we really re realistically think that we're going to be able to address the large need relative to disaffected men who are not connected to the labor force. Thank you. I have a question for Raphael, but I want to alert you to the fact that in about five minutes I'm going to turn to the audience, so start thinking about your questions. Give me, give me a minute. Oh, sure. No, after. after him. Okay. So I want to turn to you to help us with this conversation about how we take advantage of the moment, how we deal with the embedded racism in these systems, how we get the systems working on the American agenda, because this equity agenda, just and fair inclusion into a society in which all can participate, prosper, and reach their full potential. While it continues to be a moral imperative, it's become an economic and a national imperative because we are becoming a nation in which the very people who have been disproportionately left behind will be the future. The fate of the nation is depending on us getting equity right. So we've got to think about it that way. Raphael? Uh, that's a, as if I could answer that in two minutes. <laughs> But you know, no, right? You know, it's funny because um, when you, when thinking about this conversation, one thinks like, what 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 will the conversation turn out to be, right? And um, the 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 notes I have are things just in case. And I wanted to, and because I wanted to get the words right, and I wanted to read something that Cesar Chavez said because I think I think it's really important because it's so appropriate to what you just laid out. And he, uh, Cesar Chavez, for those of you who do not know, was the leader of the farm worker movement. And when I think about this discussion on stage, I think about what a unicorn I am from the zip code that I come from in California. My family came to this country as migrant farm workers. And I'm the first to graduate from high school, the first to graduate from college, the first to graduate from graduate school. And that in and of itself makes me a unicorn in a way that it shouldn't, right? Uh, and the fact is that there are many, many people in this country who have versions of that story, right? Uh, John mentioned them earlier. Uh, so Cesar Chavez led the farm worker movement to try to make sure that people who worked in the fields uh, were treated with dignity uh, and that they were able to have things like, for example, water. As, as they pick the very fruit and vegetables that we continue to eat all over the world. And he said, once social change begins, it cannot be reversed. You cannot uneducate the person that has learned to read. You cannot humiliate the person who feels pride. You cannot oppress the people who are not afraid anymore. And when I think about what you said, Angela, that's what came to mind, uh, because what strikes me is that there isn't one solution to the framing that you gave. There are many, 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 and there are gonna be some that are going to be particularly appropriate for Baltimore that may or may not be particularly appropriate for you know, Houston, Texas, or a tribal community in Montana. But the thing that I think is universally important for all of us is to you know, be the change we want to see, 
which is that there are some responsibilities that strike me uh, that we have failed to embrace um, as a country, and this is my personal opinion. Um, I think the notion of uh, being a citizen small c has gotten away from us. And the question of what is our responsibility um, for each other, what is our responsibility to each other, and how do we change these systems that have pervasively and structurally excluded so, so many people? So I think one uh, of the issues that we have to take on is the notion of actually uh, voting and access to voting. When I think about how people are put in place in these systems, be they political appointments in a city, in a county, in a state, in a federal government, when I think about um, the unelected staff that help run these systems, um, when I think about the foundations in this country, Casey being among them, who fund quote unquote think tanks that are helping produce the quote unquote knowledge that is shaping through white papers how we, um, how we think about programs, all of that is interconnected in a very complicated system. And um, if we are not able to articulate and name um, the importance of holding those systems to account and those people to account, we are not gonna see the kind of change that all of us want desperately to see in this country. So I think that ultimately it comes down to um, so sort of taking back our own democracy in a very profound and different way. So you know, now that I'm a citizen of DC, <laughs> Um, I was reminded last fall that my vote doesn't count. <laughs> and I have to tell you, and this is very important based on what Angela said, because if you think about the history of the structure of Washington, D.C., carved out of Maryland and Virginia, you know, uh, when you vote in Washington, D.C., um, technically there's an oversight committee that has responsibility for things like the budget, even though we have, quote-unquote, self-control and self-rule by a mayor. Most Americans do not know that um, you can literally not elect a congressman or congresswoman or a senator. And you have um, these things called delegates. So Eleanor Holmes Noten, for example, has been you know, a, a stalwart champion of defending the rights of DC. I tell you all this because uh, at the end of the day, if we are unable to push on the various systems and take the leap of faith required to sort of create a new system and a new way of doing business, we are going to be stuck in this trap. And I'm struck by the fact that there are these individual pockets of innovation across the country. Angela's work at PolicyLink has been one of the few places nationally that has been able to lift up where communities of opportunity have begun to thrive. And my sense is that we are just on the cusp of using social media in a way that can transform communities in a much more powerful way. Case in point, uh, Joe mentioned the fact that, um, uh, that we are not taking advantage of the STEM opportunities and others that are sort of um, you know, ripe for, for, for exploration. Uh, the fact is, is that children, our children, my two young boys, um, are digital natives. They have been raised in, in a world in which access to smartphones and our laptops and our tablets are part of their world. Yet the systems that we're trying to advance and change do not engage fully and truthfully in, in utilizing and amplifying those tools in a way that actually can transform access to jobs, access to opportunity, because there is a generational difference with how we see that technology. The fact is, is that coding and the use of language is something that every one of us can do. But we have been trained to believe that we are not good at math, or we are not good at engineering, or we are not good at these things. And what we are finding is that when you go to communities across this country, there are thousands of young people who desperately understand how to use technology to lift them out of their current circumstances. It opens up a world to them in a way that no bus or train or plane could ever really open them up. And what it's doing is allowing the creation of a new way of learning and a new way of gauging democracy and a new way of sort of transforming these systems. And I would argue that we are just on the cusp of trying to figure out how to better sort of um, tame these resources mm -hmm. to really reflect the work that we're doing because the more that we connect what's happening between Baltimore and Oakland, or a reservation, or a small urban uh, rural community in the South, the more people will feel connected to something much larger than themselves. 
And I think that's ultimately part of the answer, is that we have to be able to show that there is progress being made, mm -hmm. that there are opportunities across the country that are within reach, and that people from our neighborhoods and our communities have the talent and the power to be able to do this work because we believe in them. Thank you. Uh, Peter, just one second. How, we have questions? Do we have, where's the mic? All right, while the mic is going to someone, Peter, you wanted to make a comment. Yes, um, th thank you, Angela. Yeah. I want to say uh, girls. Yes, girls. Women. 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 Uh, <laughs> Important people. <laughs> absolutely, but not enough in this conversation. Mm -hmm. Uh, and my brother's keeper is important. Yep. We need my sister's keeper. Yep. Right. Yep. Uh, look at look at school discipline. Look look at the cradle to prison pipeline. Disproportionate uh, of girls who are disciplined. Uh, disproportionately girls of color. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not talking about that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, there. There are different aspects to it. Uh, the trauma that so many have lived uh, comes out in different ways. We're not paying attention to it. That's number one, and that relates to um, what happens in terms of as life goes on. Uh, as, as she grows up, uh, you talked about, Raphael, about those jobs. Look at the numbers on girls of all races, but especially girls of color in relation to STEM. Uh, mm -hmm. in relation to health, uh, the kinds of new good health jobs that we're going to have, uh, things that relate to science and technology generally. Girls aren't players. 8% uh, of all of the engineers uh, in the United States are women. 8%. That isn't right. So we have to have that uh, in our lens, uh, especially girls of color, uh, but both ways, all the way across the board. Uh, Thirdly, what happens uh, when uh, she goes out into the labor force uh, in this low-wage world? This, this is disproportionately about women and women of color mm -hmm. uh, who can't support their families based on these minimum wage uh, jobs. Uh, and so we have an effort in this uh, country uh, to raise minimum wages. We finally have uh, uh, an idea that's catching on of $15 uh, an hour. Uh, everybody who's concerned from the point of view, uh, everybody, but also everybody from the point of view of color uh, should be out on, on um, the street and, and, and working on it. And at SEIU and others are doing that. It's terrific. But we, we've got to understand that more than anything, this issue of low-wage jobs is about women and children. Absolutely. And, and, uh, and lastly, um, we did something to welfare at the same time mm -hmm. that we did mass incarceration with yeah. regard to men. Uh, and if anybody doesn't think that's a racial issue, you've got to take another look at the history. Uh, because this is, this is what, what we did uh, in our politics when you couldn't say the N-word anymore. You mm -hmm. couldn't be George Wallace and stand in the schoolhouse door. They started locking up the men, and they, and they started a 30-year war on welfare. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, we want people to work. Uh, that's, that's a whole lot better. But we have destroyed the safety net mm -hmm. in our country. It doesn't exist. Welfare doesn't exist anymore uh, for, uh, in half the country. And uh, we're not facing up to that. We have 6 million people in this country, and this is about women and children. We have 6 million people where the only income is from food stamps. So I want to talk about work, girls and women. Thank you so much. Thank you. First, first question. Mm -hmm. Good morning, and thank you for an extraordinary panel and for the truth and the authenticity. Um, and thank you so much, Peter, for bringing in women and girls, because when you look at the stats, the percentages in terms of girls of color and their outcomes are just a little bit behind the boys. So thank you, thank you. I wanted. Um, uh, to ask a, a different kind of question, though, which is about the work that you're seeing on the ground or the work that you're seeing in terms of governmental systems and policies, where are you seeing the discussion around compassionate and accountable capitalism? 
So I um, in, am sort of unique because I spent seven years in working uh, in capitalism, in working for financial institutions. And I've spent about 12 years working in philanthropy and I've spent now 16 years working in government. And what I clearly know in your papers have, um, in your extraordinary work, um, Angela, has really lifted this up, which is the interdependency and the connection. When you bring home the fact that it is now an economic imperative that we deal with these disparities mm -hmm. and we deal with this issue of racism, we have to bring in the contributing factors of where our business, of where the system of capitalism itself contributes to this. So I'm curious about whether it's locally here in Baltimore, the work of philanthropy, government, joining in in the authentic conversation around the role of capitalism, as Thank well you. as you, you get I've my question. It. Thank I'm you. And I'm going to take the second question at the same time. Yeah. Well, I can't believe you said that, because my note here was money. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, and, it, and it seems to me that uh, 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 this country has a, a, an idea of itself that's not correct, that prior to uh, the end of World War II, this was a rich country, but it was not an equitable country. It thrived on the backs of people who were being paid nothing or very little. So this notion of the middle class to me is a rather uh, new notion. So we had this golden age of 40 or 50 years of prosperity. There was so much money we had to give it away, <laughs> right? The America we have now is the America that we were. So when I hear people talk about, let's take back my America, well, you have, and here we are. So these uh, constructs of, of race and sexism, um, ageism, and all the other kind of things that we use as tools to help a select few, relatively speaking, in the country, 310 million people, amass a tremendous amount of wealth and keep it <laughs> seem central to this conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know how we get to it. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not being antithetical, I think, to the conversation around race and equity and opportunity. But I think we have to factor in that this conversation should be framed inside of a reality that really dictates against the sharing of wealth. Good. Got it. And I'm going to take this question, and then we'll come back to the panel. Great. I wanted to, um, I wanted to really invite the panel to talk about um, how we bridge across communities of color on common issues related to reducing barriers to opportunity, especially given the fast-growing demographics of Latino and immigrant communities. And so I made a short list and would love to sort of get your sense of that. One is I think there's a common issue related to the impact of law enforcement on communities of color and in immigrant and refugee communities. That is, uh, immigration enforcement is resulting in child and family separation and families going into detention centers that are not in the regular domestic um, uh, system. So they become invisible and disappear. I think access to driver's license in terms of jobs Here's how I think it plays out in both immigrant and refugee communities and also African American communities. It is about, uh, you've got unpaid tickets, so you can't, that impinges your ability to have a driver's license. For um, immigrant and refugee communities, legal status uh, uh, often uh, gets in the way of that. College affordability. Joe, you talked about the fact that you got stuck into going to remedial uh, developmental ed track. That means you're not eligible for Pell grants and financial aid because those are often non-credit bearing courses. Um, literacy and language uh, issues and legal status, you've got out of state tuition uh, for, for uh, immigrant kids. And then building savings and wealth uh, for unbanked and underbanked, once again, identity documents, how, where, where are those institutions, financial institutions cited versus the predatory lenders that view uh, uh, low-income communities as VIP customers and are open. So I just sort of, what are the bridge issues that we as communities of color have a common agenda around that is not just place-based, but really is about access to opportunity? 
Thank you. Great questions. Um, you ready to jump in? Which one are you jumping in on? Uh, I was going to summarize them, but obviously you well, don't need ahead. me to do that. No, go ahead. <laughs> well, uh, essentially all three. But, okay, go uh, ahead. Just uh, on, number, on number three, I was talking about the minimum wage. You, you know, there's a whole bunch of things where it's what I said about we need to have uh, keep two ideas in our, in our mind. We need to find all of the ways, and it's a long, long list, even much longer than that, mm -hmm. uh, where we should be cutting across uh, all minorities and everybody uh, in America to work on uh, some, of, some of those issues. Some of those other ones are, are things where you, you might have a kind of a smaller uh, coalition. But I want to address the, the first two, mm -hmm. uh, which are very related to each other. Um, we can't, I, I went for a lot of years, I have to say, just as my personal sort of uh, way of approaching it, was to talk about poverty and not talk so much about uh, people at the top. Uh, it was like, and I think, well, I now know I was wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, it was like, yeah, I don't want to get them all mad. Let's, let's see if we can co-opt them and, you know, maybe they'll be more helpful. <laughs> Baloney. Uh, <laughs> We, we can't talk about poverty without talking about inequality. Cannot do that. In fact, it goes the other way around. We need to tell the rest of the country that they can't talk about inequality without talking about poverty. You're going to talk about the 1%, you're going to talk about the 99%, you need to do 99 all the way to the bottom. We're not doing that. And, and, and you know, we don't lack money in the last 40 years. The economy's gotten twice as large in real terms, and it's none of it's gone down to the bottom. That's right. You know, we've done a lot of good things with policies, and we should celebrate them. But uh, the, all of the, the new money and wealth has gone to people in the top 1% and really the top 100th of 1% mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and so on. There's a poll yesterday in the New York Times, and this is so important, a uh, majority of people in this country are worried about inequality. That's good. Then you break it down, and I hate to say something about political parties, mm -hmm. this is a right a C3 operation here. Uh, but uh, d Democrats said that public policy has to play a role in dealing with inequality. Uh, essentially, the rich have to pay their fair share, but it goes much more than that. It, what's happened to Citizens United, what's happened with gerrymandering, what's happened uh, with the Koch brothers and, and all of that, I'm afraid for our democracy. It's not just the economic power. That yields political power. So we absolutely have to have, but the Republicans, only four out of ten, said that, that they thought that public policy had anything to do with it. That's a huge challenge. Thank you. Joe? Yeah, I'd like to uh, focus on that. The first uh, the young lady who uh, posed the first question about capitalism business. She's looking for accountable, compassionate capitalism. Yeah. So I don't know that I would look for uh, <laughs> compassionate, right? If it comes, fine. You know, I like to think that everybody has a social conscience, but, you know, realistically, when you talk about capitalism and business, people are looking at trying to meet the bottom line. You know, how do you increase wealth? Uh, but relative to the recent unrest, what I've noticed uh, as a result of, you know, and prior to, we've had a lot of investment in Baltimore in certain areas. One area that, you know, is most known to people is out in the harbor, right? We really mm -hmm. put a lot of effort and investment into our inner harbor and stadia, right? Uh, in certain parts of the, of the community, we've had investments in other areas. But in many parts of the city, there has been no investment. And a lot of the areas that I'm talking about where there's no investment are the ones that come to the, mar the forefront of the American psyche because of the unrest, right? However, out of that, a few things happen that are forcing business, not because of their social conscience, maybe a little bit of that, but more so because of the bottom line. So a few things happen. One, uh, there was a Baltimore Orioles game that was played. Yeah. There was not a fan in the stadium. The economic <laughs> reverberation of that, right? Not just in terms of what happened on, with concessionaires, but what happened with bars, pubs, and restaurants in the periphery, right? Secondly, also related to the Orioles, there were three game, home games, right, where that, that was to be played here 
that could not, there wasn't a reciprocal home visitor schedule. So these three games then got transferred out of Baltimore to the other team's home stadium, right? Those, those games will not be made up, right, in Baltimore. So you've lost the economy for the one game where there were no fans, three games that won't be made up, right? We also instituted a curfew, right? During the time of the curfew, businesses had to close, right? A major player that is now reporting the impact of the curfew is the brand new casino here in Baltimore, right? So when businesses start losing money at that level, you might want to infer compassion has something to do with it, right? <laughs> I would suggest probably there's less of that and more of, oh, shucks, right? And I would spell shucks differently. Right? So there are now folks who are looking at what took place and said, this can't continue, right? Because they really, they're smart people and they're aware that what, what has been uncovered is the kind of stuff that usually, you know, if you come to my house, right, uh, and I see your car pull up and I didn't know you were coming, I sweep the dust underneath the carpet, right? And I hope that you don't see the dust, but the dust is still there. But what we've uncovered is the dust that has gone on in our communities, and I think everybody now is aware of it. So how do we take this opportunity and moment in time to engage folks in the business community? And I would think that, you know, and hope that one of the things that Casey would do is also to think about now how do we engage business, the business community a little bit more in terms of what needs to go into community to create the, and change the structural divide that exists so that they, they can meet their bottom line, and we can also help them to develop more of a social conscience. But as long as they're at the table bringing their intellect, right? Because they're good people that work in business. I'm convinced that I know a lot of these folks. I got employers in, in, in my bandwidth of folks that are, that are hiring black men with criminal records, right? Training them in apprenticeship, right? So I know that they're good people. Still, the bottom line is they want to make money, right? But we've got to force these conversations in a way in which I think sometimes we've let people off the hook. And if, it keep, and it, and if social rest, unrest is the reason why we got there, we can't do anything about the past. That happened. That unrest did happen. But now we can take advantage of that conversation and try to move it forward in a much more productive way. Raphael. I want to take a slightly different take on this. And I'm reminding of the New York Times article um, that just came out, I think it was two days ago, on the CVS case. Mm -hmm. So real quick, um, CVS is being sued by several of its employees. Uh, for, for, pardon? Former. former employees, yes, former, that's true. Well, they all worked there. And um, they're doing it because there was a system of explicit bias and explicit racism around uh, staff being directed to follow and to essentially name or, uh, African American and Latino customers uh, because they, they are, according to some of the supervisors, were more prone to steal. Um, why I bring up that case right now is that um, I was reminded of sort of the things that Irene brought up and, and Peter's response of yes is a correct response. All those things matter, Irene. But I, I wanna take a slightly different take on it and bring up something that sort of always uh, is unsettling to me personally around the, 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 the debate on poverty, which is that um, there is often a paternalistic um, a way of talking about um, services for people in a way that I think is not about giving power uh, to the client who actually is really seeking out an opportunity, right? I have not met in my life, in my neighborhood, in my state, or as I've traveled the country for different kinds of jobs, anyone who is poor, who doesn't want to have a safe home to come home to and raise their children, who doesn't want a decent job to be able to put food on their table, who doesn't want a safe neighborhood and where their kids can play, you know, who doesn't want, you know, all of the things uh, that really is about opportunity. And no one wants services. And I will say this as someone who is a former recipient of welfare services. And I'm struck by the fact that in the context of our national conversation, sometimes it is over-intellectualized in such a way that we diminish the power and the talent of the people who are just trying to live and to live their lives and to give their families a better life, an opportunity. And I would, I would challenge all of us, myself included, that at the end of the day, people need help to get by and to move up in life. But what they want more than anything is to just give themselves an opportunity to change whatever course they've been dealt with or whatever hand they've been dealt with. 
And we can look at these questions from a variety of perspectives, right? There's a ton of amazing work, um, um, theoretical frameworks around systems theories and complex theories, um, uh, complexity theory, uh, how all things are interconnected. But I would simply say, the question we, I think we should all walk out with today is what might your community or your job look like if we simply started to ask ourselves, what more can I do in my role to lift up and to honor the people that I am serving? And I think every single one of us has that opportunity. And if we did that more often, I think we'd have more compassion in how we, how we serve our communities. I, I truly believe that we would have um, less division on these issues. And because I, I, I really believe, you know, I was in North Carolina a couple of months ago for a conversation on reducing the dropout rate, and it was disproportionately African-American. And in that room, the majority of the people in the room were white. And if I used a political lens to look at the likelihood of their political affiliations, one could argue that in this, I think it was South Carolina, that they were probably majority Republican people. I spent the day with these folks. Throughout the course of the day, but for one sort of clear political commentary that was sort of anti-democratic and anti-President Obama, the people in this room cared deeply about those kids. And they wanted desperately to figure out how to provide a life opportunity for these young people. And I was struck by that because when I left that day and I was flying back, I thought to myself, you know, if I had to just do a sort of hardline cut of politics, I would say, these are Republicans who don't care, bringing up this ideological conversation. And I just believe that at the end of the day, they really do care, and we have to find a way to connect with people in a way that we just don't know how to do. And if we strip away all of the sort of baggage that we, we bring to our work, and according, again, the sort of paternalistic perspective, I think we'd actually all be better off. Because at the end of the day, we'd actually be able to see the person that you are, and the, and the talent and the integrity that you bring to the work. And I think that part of it, this notion of you know, our humanity and our love that we don't often talk about in public spaces, particularly in places like this, is desperately needed now more than ever. And that, I think, is what gives me hope about all the things that have been brought up in the last couple Thank of questions. Thank you. Are there other questions? Could you come down while you're coming, and if there's another, because this is probably the last round, so don't think that you have 15 more minutes to think about your question. Um, I wanted to pick up on the first two questions about capitalism and the larger structural issues, because they relate to the third question. We absolutely need to take advantage of the fact that our economy is still in crisis. It is still in deep crisis. And we're not going to get the economy right if we don't figure out how to get the equity agenda right. So we need to really understand that we have a wide open moment, not just a moment to talk about race, but a moment to talk about the economy and how it is dependent upon the entrepreneurship, the leadership, the workforce readiness, the 21st century problem solving, all of those things that we need to have come from the very people who are being left behind, the economy desperately needs it. And we're stuck in this inequality moment that is not working for anybody. The middle class is not stable. We don't even, we haven't even begun to really uncover how people who were white and in the middle class are hanging on by a thread. Poverty is deep and concentrated and worse than it has ever been, and we have got to do something about it. And the structure is going to keep things just as they are if we don't come up with big structural solutions. And related to the third question about what do we have in common, what we have in common is that if we can solve these problems for the most vulnerable, we will solve them for everybody. And that is the only way to solve problems for everybody. If you try to solve for the elite, you solve for the elite. If you try to solve for the middle class, you might solve for the middle class. If you solve for those who are most vulnerable, it's going to cascade all the way up. And so that's the way we have to think, how to tell that narrative in a way that while this may be focused on someone who has vulnerabilities that you may not see in yourself. That if we look there, we will find a way to really unleash the potential of the nation. And when we unleash the potential of the nation, the nation benefits. One, two, three. And then we'll close up. 
I was just wondering if you could speak towards the potential of a local and national truth and reconciliation conversation in, the, in how it might develop risk and courage and shift from um, saving to love. Thank you. Yes? Uh, you know, I'm struck by uh, this idea uh, around advocating for people and advocating with people. And I've been in a lot of spaces where I've seen us talk about race um, where there's 300 very intelli in in intelligent people, um, but we're advocating, we're talking about another population that's not in the room. So we're, mm. we're advocating for parents of color, but there's no parents of color there. We're advocating for children of color, but youth voice is not there. Um, how do you, in your respective roles, uh, check that? How are you advocating with the communities that um, you talk about and not just for the communities that you talk about? Thank you, yes. Hello, I'm the president of a nonprofit that supports and advocates for neighborhoods all around Mandarman Mall. So we sit right where that redlining map is, and when you put the other map on top of it of disinvestment, that's the community that I support and I advocate for. And so my question is, how can the neighborhood associations and the nonprofits that are on the ground that have held up this city basically with no resources and just God's help and getting out there and talking to people to get people to um, realize that these neighborhoods are viable. How can we um, continue to bring, now that I'm being brought in conversations, I've gone from being the spook who sat by the door to now being the voice of the West Side, right? So I've been saying the same thing for I don't know how long about what we need. Now all of a sudden because of the unrest, now we're heard. So now I'm get, being pulled into rooms where I probably normally wouldn't be pulled in, rooms that I've been asked to go in but have not for whatever reason. Now I'm being pulled into these rooms. So how can I get them to understand how important it is to support these nonprofits that are on the ground? Not yeah. just with programming dollars, but with operating support, because that helps to sustain these neighborhood communities, organizations that have been holding up the city all along. Thank you for your question, and thank you for what you do. Uh, last question. Thank you. Uh, Peter, you've been talking about girls and women. And what we haven't talked about is the trauma that girls and women experience when they're violated, yes. when they're physically and sexually violated. And what I'm finding at the bottom ground, uh, working with women and children, is that almost 100% of them have experienced violence against them by men. And so I don't think that we can get a healthy society unless we address that piece, and how do we do that? Thank you. If you need me to summarize, I will, but jump right in. Sort of Ryan's question, and I don't know your name in the back. Paula. Um, you know, Martin Luther King once said, you may not be able to see the whole staircase, but take the first step in faith, or some version of that. I am such a true believer in that, and I would say, um, bottom line, you gotta put a stake in the ground somewhere, and you gotta try. So what does that look like, right, sort of practically? So I'm gonna give a couple of examples in different roles I've held, um, and then uh, uh, sort of try to frame it up so that it's not just an abstract, right? So number one, I was early in my career twice elected to represent the, the, the city council neighborhood in which I was born in California. And that had, the neighborhoods had historically been the home to multiple kinds of immigrants, recently now Mexican, but Filipino, Chinese, Yugoslavian, et cetera. And at the time, they would give every council member a, literally a key to City Hall. And the neighborhoods were literally across the street from City Hall and encompassed all this industrial area. And um, most of the people I served were Spanish speaking, and many of them were undocumented. And I would do this thing where I would make banners and say, you know, council member Glover Blackwell, Mayor Edelman, Governor Jones. And I'd put it on there around their neck, and we'd go into City Hall. And I would walk them through what it was like to walk into that council chamber, many of which was the first time they had ever stepped foot in that council chamber, and walk them through what it would be like to sit on the dais of those chairs and to be the governor or the mayor or the council member. And I swear to you, unscientifically, I didn't have an evidence-based practice model for it. The way they sat changed. The way they spoke changed. Um, everything about them, most of them farm workers, changed because they got to sit in the seats of power. And I felt like I didn't have, at the time, any way to connect what I was trying to do around economic development 
and jobs and after school programs and all the various things that we actually ultimately did do in a regional context. And that one exercise that we did multiple times allowed people to get a glimmer of what it was like to walk into a building that ultimately was really theirs. So taking that first step was just trying. It was just trying something. And there were many, many, many things in that role that I failed at miserably. But on that one thing, it was transformative. Two, the issue of bringing authentic voice to the work that we do. I don't care what it is um, that we're doing. If you are talking about children, youth, and families writ large, you need to have some representation of them in the room. And uh, it is far easier to not have them in the room, right? Because it's actually easy to into over-intellectualize and theorize about what they believe and what they want and what they think. You know, that's easy to do. It's, hard, it's harder to do the other. And I would say, again, on a practical notion, how you have conversations with people matters immensely. Just having them. And two, breaking bread with each other. I cannot tell you how often food, every one of us in this room, I kid you not, has a tradition of family and culture. Whatever that family and culture is, by biology or by structure, we build these communities, right? And when we break bread together, and when we are willing to have courageous conversations, or simply a conversation, how are you today, Ryan? Um, you know, how is your son doing? Um, how are you feeling? These kinds of things seem so simple, but matter immensely. And I think that every one of us has both a right and a responsibility to do that in a more authentic way, using our, both our formal and our informal roles to open up doors and use our positional power, whatever it is, to allow more people to enter the conversation. I desperately believe that if we did that more often, more people would feel included, more people would feel respected, and more people would feel honored. Because then we say to them, you have something to contribute. You have worth. You have value. And that is powerful. You know, uh, earlier this year, we, uh, I told the story earlier about our Keisha and Raheem, this couple who receiving public benefits. So we worked very hard with our legislature, and we got a bill passed in the legislature in 2013 uh, as a pilot and in partnership with Casey uh, and the Alley Evaluator uh, and the state of Maryland through the Department of Human Resources, which is where our child support, family investment, and TANF programs are. So we meet monthly, uh, and the bill was coming up for uh, continuation. And, uh, and so our legislative champion uh, called me, sort of like on short notes, said, hey, the bill's going to be heard tomorrow. Can you come down? I said, yep, but I need to be able to bring, you know, one of the families with me. And he said, sure, you know, do you know who it is? I said, right now I can't tell you. We'll figure it out. So one couple who uh, was going to go, and one of the, 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 the initiative does two things. It works to help them increase their relationship skill, but get both of them into the labor market at the same time. This particular couple was working, so they could not get off to go. So we had another couple who had just finished the program, weren't yet uh, employed, and I didn't know them all that well. So uh, I, drive, I get them in my car, and to go from Baltimore to Annapolis, where our legislature is, is about a 35-minute ride. And so I'm doing the coaching as we go. So I'm getting to know them. They're getting to know me. I give them a pad, uh, each one of them a pad with an uh, ink pen, and said, look, let's just talk about this bill. Let's go through it on the fly, right? And they're looking at me, and I'm not quite sure they got it, right? So I'm out here on blind faith. This can, go, this can go north or this can go south, right? But I firmly believe in the people that we work with, and if you give them the space, they can do their own advocacy, right? But I'm still not really sure, y'all, right? <laughs> so we get down there, my legislative champion, he starts off, the chairman of the committee hears him, that's his boy, so we do good there, right? Ask me for my little testimony, kind of good there. Then it's time for the couple, right? And I'm like, okay, let's see what we got, right? This couple, right, took that car ride dissected that bill, right? And when they started talking, right, the entire committee, right, started asking them questions, right? Me and my legislative champion, we sat back in the gap. We didn't have to say another word, right? They talked about the value of what it meant to be engaged in services, building their families, what they wanted to do economically. And at the conclusion, the chairman said, I'd like to have a favorable vote, vote now. He didn't say, I'd like to have a vote now. He said, I'd like to have a favorable vote vote now. And as we went out into the hallway after uh, the, the hearing, all of these legislators came out and talked, particularly to the dad, right? They told him how, how much it meant for them to see him 
in that hearing talking about building his family with his partner. And I think the more that we can give people the opportunity to be advocates for their own lives, the more we can influence policy and change in ways in which I think we can be helpful, but I think we can't do as much justice as the folks that we care most about can do. Thank you, Joe. Uh, just very quickly, uh, thank you uh, for talking about violence and women. Um, I did, when I talked about the trauma that girls have that shows up in uh, some of the things that happen in school that do require a response, not the response that's given, it, it's because they've been uh, subjected to violence by somebody whether in the home or in, in, in some way. There's so many kids who were girls in child welfare uh, who were there because of trauma, violence that's been in their lives. Uh, and in too many cases, this leads to trafficking, uh, which, to which our response is to treat it as a crime instead of something that someone needs help. So thank you for that. Uh, second, uh, I just would add the word organize. Uh, to the conversation, and I think we all know what we mean, and that covers, that relates to, I think, three of the four uh, questions, uh, and, and uh, it's much, much longer conversation. And finally, uh, Angela, uh, on the question of the focus on the economy and the big structural answers, uh, we talked about, uh, about infrastructure. The fact is we need a conversation about the structure of our economy, where jobs come from uh, in our economy, whether the combination of the private and public sectors that we have now is, to, is going to get us there in terms of jobs that pay a living wage. Um, and it, there are large national needs. It isn't just infrastructure. Start there. It's affordable housing, it's, it's caregiving in a variety of ways, children and, and, and uh, elderly uh, and so on. Uh, th there is going to be a new set of, of, of health care jobs, it's, it's happening. But we need to be talking about all the ways in which uh, we have these national needs. It doesn't mean people on a public payroll, but it needs public funding. And that means there has to be a serious national discussion about the amount of revenue that we take in and that takes us back to inequality. Absolutely. We are not a poor country and we need to stop acting like one. Um, I just want to comment on the question about those people working in communities to make a difference. Uh, the tagline at PolicyLink is lifting up what works because we believe that local leaders are national leaders. They are solving the nation's problems and we need to be able to understand what they are learning. We need to fund them appropriately to be able to do what they're doing. And we need to lift up what is being learned into policy so that these good efforts don't just remain a one-off, but we're actually embedding what we know so that we can reach the level of scale and inclusion that we need. I thank you for a really uh, engaging conversation. Thank you. And to close, I want to bring up uh, Casey's own Donna Stark, Vice President for Talent and Leadership Development. For so many years, uh, it, we've all been working on this and honor those who have worked on it before us. And uh, it remains uh, with so much more to do. Uh, and in these kinds of conversations, one can become overwhelmed and tired. But I am inspired. I am re-energized and fueled by this incredibly powerful discussion uh, and conversation. Thank you so much. Oh, I'm breathless.
voice from you, my goodness. Ah, get to rehearse. Um, in closing, there's a, just a couple of brief remarks. Of course, some thank yous uh, to Nanette Sykes at uh, the heart of this. And uh, some of the behind the scenes people, Ryan Fox, who was our producer. <laughs> Thank you. Jamil Hines, who isn't with us today, but right hand partner uh, to Nanette. And of course, <laughs> Angela, uh, not just for today, but for a lifetime. And. And the incredible panelists, uh, you know, I call you panelists. You're like so dear and precious and wonderful in your gift to us today. Uh, so thank you for that. <laughs> and uh, the pleasure of having uh, Casey Fellows. I want to just say a shout out to Ryan and Shana and Carla who were able to work with Nanette to integrate this into the Fellows Weekend. Uh, thank you, as always, to our trustee, Joe Madero, who sits side by side with us in the work and on these issues. So thank you also. Uh, those of you who know me, and as I looked at the audience, it's like, I know almost everybody here. Uh, you won't be surprised with my final thoughts, which um, speak really to uh, the personal side of this for me. We've lifted up so many uh, ways of thinking about and doing something about uh, racial equity in this country, economic equity, and all of these strategies are really important. And everybody in this room is here because that is the work that you do every day. And you do it in partnerships, and you do it in coalitions, and you live it. And uh, it is so embedded in every aspect of your life that um, there's no separation, you know, the personal and the political, of course. Uh, but I was thinking, uh, and again, it uh, I think this notion of Aside from everything that I do, everything that you do with everybody else, how do I think about just a little something more that I'm the only one that has any control over? And many of you know in our, uh, in our work we often talk, we always talk about action commitments and we close our gatherings and our meetings with action commitments. Our action commitments are public statements about what I am going to do and what I am going to hold myself accountable for. And making it public what you can now hold me accountable for. So I've been, like everybody else, in preparation for this, reading some more and thinking some more. And so I'm going to make an action commitment that's only about me. And I'm also going to ask you over the course of the day to do the same for yourselves. So uh, for me, I'm uh, always troubled uh, by my own biases and uh, worried that how deeply they are in me and what I can do to name them and notice them and do something about them. And so my uh, action commitment today is really uh, about naming uh, the notion of, or the distinction that I'm working on, on sameness and differentness. And how important it is for there to be in me a much stronger, stronger sense of sameness with those that I might often see as different. That I've got to, in working on my own biases, 
uh, feel that sameness, feel that empath empathy as foundational in my working on this aspect. And so my commitment is to be much more intentional about living the notion and connection of sameness. And uh, so I'm inviting you, as you always do, to hold me accountable for what I'm committing to do. But I also ask you to make an action commitment for yourself, something that you have control over. You don't need anybody else. You can do it. To think about one, create one for yourself, say it out loud, and hold yourself accountable for that. And with that, I thank you all and thank everybody who contributed to making this a most amazing morning. Thank you all.